You're tuned in to Ask the Master Auto Technician. Car questions? Get answers right now. Call 850-763-0555. James Auto Center. We fix it right. Guarantee. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. All right, good morning, everybody. It's Monday morning. It's early, and it's starting to become brighter out there. Yes, the days are, the sunrise is starting to come up a little bit more often, and right when we get used to it, they'll slam us back into darkness again. It never fails, but <laughs> that's just the way it is with daylight savings time. Anyway, it has its advantages, has its disadvantages. The advantages is you get to go home, and it's not dark at night. You got lots of things to do at night. The disadvantage is you get up in the morning come to work and it's dark when you come to work but hey it gets better but one of the things you might want to start start thinking about doing that a lot of people just don't seem to do I, I don't know what it is is they don't seem to bother to ever check the air in their tires or bother to check the fluids in their vehicle they may check the oil yeah they, they put a dipstick they may do that but that's about the extent of it uh, they overlook a lot of the they overlook some two things that I think are very very important that if people wouldn't overlook them they'd be able to solve a lot of problems a lot quicker. One is the coolant level. Uh, even, if, even if you have to take a, a, a Sharpie and mark the coolant level on your reservoir and actually look down inside your radiator, that needs to be done on a regular basis. Two reasons. One, you can have a leak in the radiator and your reservoir will never go down and your car will run hot and you can actually ruin your engine. I'm not making this, I have it coming all the time. People come in, my car is running hot, I don't know, know why, and they tow it into me and I got a blown head gasket on it. And I look over in the coolant reservoir bottle and it's fine. There's not a thing, I mean the coolant reservoir bottle is right where it's supposed to be. It says it's full when cold. It says it's full when hot, it just says it's full. We pull the radiator cap off, it's empty. Why is that? That's because we got a leak in either the heater core or got a, heat, a leak in the water pump. Someplace else it's leaking. And when the car cools down, it creates a vacuum to pull that coolant back into the, back into the engine. As it was expanded, as it got hot, it gets pushed into the reservoir and it gets, as it cools down, it creates a vacuum and sucks it back in. Well, if there's no vacuum to create, it's not gonna suck it back in. So you open your hood, Look over there and go, wow, I've got plenty of coolant in my uh, coolant reservoir. You look at your brake fluid over there and you go, well, it looks fine over there. And all you're looking for is level. Well, that's all. You, unfortunately, the level of the brake fluid, yeah, they could tell you that you've got brake fluid in there, but it doesn't tell you the condition. But at the same time, if you don't look inside the radiator reservoir, excuse me, inside the radiator on some cars, you'll never know if they're low. Now, Ford's had the reservoir bottle as part of the radiator. Uh, when it goes low on a Ford, you, you, that's definitely low. You can definitely see it. But General Motors, that's a perfect example of a car that, does, that has a, uh, a, a reservoir that doesn't, uh, that's not like a, like a Ford. General Motors is that way. Ford is that way. A lot of, not Ford, General Motors, Chrysler is that way. A lot of cars are that way. A lot of uh, European and a lot of Asian cars have a coolant reservoir, which is separate from the radiator. Uh, you have a radiator cap that's on the radiator, and if you have a radiator cap that's on the radiator, you're going to have an overflow bottle or coolant reservoir someplace that's separate. That is, that is what I'm talking about. Those are the ones you really need to pull the radiator cap off when the car is cold. Preferably when it's been sitting overnight, there's no pressure on it, there's no danger of being burned, because that's where a lot of accidents in, in my industry take place, is when uh, people that don't know any better will pull the radiator cap off 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 of a hot engine or a warm engine thinking well it's not that hot it's no big deal and it'll scald them and can burn them severely trust me i've been burned many a time and it does not feel good when you get yeah, burned the temperature of coolant can be over, 200 plus degrees over 212 degrees remember that remember we put antifreeze in it to keep it from boiling cars some yeah. cars the radiator fans don't come on to 225. yeah That's and just remember that the water heater the hot water in your house is only like 130, 140. Yeah, that, that's right. You know, you're not <laughs> water in your radiator is not supposed to be going on you, or your or your coolant in your radiator is not supposed to be going on human skin, and it'll get up to 225, 230. I've seen it as high as 245 degrees and not have a problem with the car. That's the way the car is designed to work. It bounces between 245 down to 220, 245, 220. I thought it was pretty hot, but that's the way this car was designed to operate. And I said, okay, let's leave it alone. But most cars operate between 225 and 200, somewhere in that general area. Most, some of the exotics work a little higher. But uh, on the rule of thumb is they're going to be hotter than boiling. 
And if you got a car out there and you're worried about it, checking the coolant level on it, wait till the car is completely cold, sitting overnight, pull the radiator cap off. You're going to push down and turn in most cases. A lot of people just try to turn, it won't come off. You have to push down and turn. If you'll do that, push down and turn counterclockwise, you'll get the radiator cap off. Look down inside and see if you see any coolant inside there. Now, if you see coolant, that's a good sign. Now, it doesn't tell you if the condition of the coolant's any good, but that's where I come in. That's where a shop like mine can come in, whether it's James Auto Center or the shop you go to, ask them to check the pH level, the reserve alkalinity, and the concentration. Those are the three things a pH strip does. It tells you the concentration. You want it to be at least eight or better on the pH. Honest to goodness. I know neutral is seven. Yes, yes, everybody says, well, neutral is seven. Well, on the day's extended life antifreeze, if you've got anything less than eight, once it gets pressurized, it drops to about seven, five, uh, and it gets hot. Once you start getting it hot, you can actually, the pH actually drops a little bit, and it doesn't, by keeping it above eight or better, it doesn't destroy the plastic. That's one of the things we have found out. Today's coolant doesn't not, not necessarily just uh, change the metallurgy of the structure of the, of the metal and keeps it from dissolving. It does a great job of doing that uh, from galvanization and, and, and electrolysis. That's not a problem anymore when it comes to today's coolant. What the problem is, is the plastics. Yes, the plastics will, the backbone, the strength of the plastic will actually disintegrate, become brittle uh, when it, and that's what it does when it gets below eight, it starts to, to dissolve the plastic inside. Yeah, it. now I will say most plastics do get brittle over mm -hmm. time. They I mean, do. that's just a characteristic of the material. They do, but when you're adding, uh, when you're pressurizing it, yeah. adding a well, lot of see, temperature. So, so this expedites or really yes. speeds up the process. It happens when it reaches over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. People go, 300 degrees Fahrenheit? My car doesn't run that hot. No, it doesn't. But when you shut the car off in the summertime and it's been, you've been running it hard, it gets up there to 300 degrees. Maybe not very long, maybe just for a minute or two, or maybe for three or four minutes. I don't know, depending on the temperature and how hot everything is. But when you shut the car off, that heat's got to go someplace. Well, it just goes and usually goes up to the top of the engine. And the top of the engine is where your thermostat is, and that's where your intake manifold gaskets are, and that's where your plastic intake manifold is. This is made out of nylon 6.6, .6, which dissolves uh, from, plat from the uh, pH that it, or the concentration. If you don't keep the pH above 8, things are going to happen. Every two years, every 30,000 miles, you, either you listen to me and trust me on this, or you don't listen to me and you're going to spend a lot more later. There's no such thing as permanent antifreeze. There's no such thing as five-year, 150,000-mile antifreeze. Yes, in a perfect world where there's a Walmart, or excuse me, where there's a Walgreens and a CVS on every corner, yes, I guess you could have it where it goes five years or 150,000 miles, but that's not the real world. And we don't have a CVS and a Walgreens on every corner. It just seems like it. But the point I'm trying to say is antifreeze is only good for about two years or 30,000 miles. Now, I have a lot of people say, well, it takes me five years but 30,000 miles. I still, change your antifreeze after two years. I have people come in here with 40 to 50,000 miles on a car that's six years old, and i got to do over $2,000 worth of work because they haven't bothered to change the antifreeze. It's been in there the entire time. It's got 40,000 miles on it. The car is about six years, maybe seven years old. It's not being driven at all, and it's nothing but a big mess inside there. I've got problems. I mean, it's just, I've got a mess. And it's because the customer believed that uh, the car salesman said, you get five years or 150,000 miles of antifreeze, not like the old two years, 30,000 mile antifreeze we used to have. Wrong answer. It still is two years, 30,000 miles. I don't care what the manufacturer will tell you because General Motors said for a long time, we're going to sell this as five years, 150,000 miles, and we'll get green credits from the government. And they did until they got a class action lawsuit brought against them because they're finding out if you went that far, things destroyed. If you bought a car, if you buy a car in Canada, yeah, Canada. Yeah, and you're, I got Canadian people down here still for, you know, they're down here for the winter still. If you look at your owner's manual, it'll tell you if your car is purchased in, if General Motors car is purchased in Canada, change it every two years, over 30,000 miles. If you bought that same car in Detroit, it'll say five years, 150,000 miles. Why? It's because in Canada, General Motors lost a class action lawsuit, and that's why they had to change it to two years, 30,000 miles. I'm telling you, if you want your car to last a long time, if you want to have less maintenance bills and want to have less repair bills and less crisis management, 
Don't let your antifreeze go more than two years, 30,000 miles. After 10 years, throw your radiator and hoses away and replace them. I got people out there going, 10 years, I only got 100,000 miles in my car in 10 years. Trust me, radiators don't last more than 100,000 miles or 10 years, even if you change the antifreeze every two years or every 30,000 miles. Yes, I know it sounds like a lot of money to spend, but how much does an engine cost? How much does a car cost? How much does an engine have to replace an engine? Years ago, we had brass copper radiators. We, put, we carried about three and a half to four gallons of coolant, and uh, the brass copper radiators could take a lot of abuse. They could leak and they'd seal themselves back up because of the solder bloom inside there. It wasn't a big deal. And we didn't think much about it. Cars got a little green and crusty. Ah, just doing okay. You know, don't worry about it. We'd put some Prestone or, salt or pepper in there, or whatever it took to seal the leak up. Well, we had a lot of reservoir. We had a lot of weight. We had a lot of extra. Well, we don't have that anymore. We got radiators that are teeny tiny. Some cars, and I mean the entire cooling system, only has a little more than two and a half to three gallons. That's all that's in there. That, that is it. You lose a half a gallon, the car is going to run hot. You could actually ruin your car. Won't take much. Remember, the manufacturer designs vehicles that get through warranty. That's what they're required to do. Will it get through warranty? Ask Mark Sarlo, automotive engineer. He says the same thing. The bean counters take a look at it and say, okay, this is what it costs to make this car. Where can we cut back at? Well, we can cut back on XYZ right here because it makes the car lighter and it does this, it does that, and it gets through warranty. Well, what's the warranty? 36,000, 50,000, 100,000? Well, whatever the warranty is, it can get through. It's after the warranty is over, that's when it falls back on you. So when they tell you you can go 12,000 miles or 10,000 miles between oil change, yeah, you can. It'll get you through warranty. But no, your car won't last. Yes, you'll be end up changing a timing chain or changing an engine when you reach 100,000 miles. So if you own a Mercedes, you own a BMW, you own a Toyota, you own any of these cars out here that take full synthetic oil and the manufacturer says, hey, you can go 10,000 miles between oil changes. Yeah, you can. Yes, you really can. But your oil filter is stopped up at about 5,000 miles and it's now in bypass mode. Well, you can drive 100 miles an hour on the road too, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you're not going to face consequences. <laughs> well, there's the consequences of your actions right there. So uh, Once I again, just because you can do something doesn't make it smart. Sure, you know, like you try to tell me, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, that's one of those things out there in life you learn real, real quick. You can't go 10,000 miles on an oil change. Yeah, you can. Yes, the oil doesn't break down. The oil gets overloaded, but on synthetic oil, it's still good. The problem is your filter is not filtering anymore. That's the catch. Your filter doesn't filter. It's in bypass mode. I try to tell people that, and they look at me and go, huh? Why do you think they got a check valve in there? Why do you think there's a bypass valve in there? Because filters get clogged. If you go with a stock filter, a General Motors stock filter, and you take one and you check those out, they're at about 5,000, four to five, four to 5,000 miles. They're in bypass mode. And at one time, they were telling people to go 7,500 miles between oil changes. Well, they found out that didn't work. They were changing timing chains left and right under warranty. Yeah, that's what happens when you have um, marketing people writing the owner's manual yep. and engineers giving the, you know, well, you can do this, we're gonna but... We're going to be back on this and just, we got, we're up against the clock. We'll be right back. Give us a call, 850-763-0555. It's free information Monday. Give us a call. That's what we do every day, Monday through Friday, right here on Fox 28. We'll be right back. James Auto Center. We fix it right. Guaranteed. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah.